What so proudly we hailed at the twilight's... <laughs> what Bruce just said. That was an incredible statement. Bruce, thank you very much. And to the band Animals in Hindsight and Travis Young and Alicia Sonia and Nicole Michelle Lutsky, we thank you very much for those kind introductions. I think Bruce summarized it all. Why not? Why not? Why not create the kind of country we know we can become. And the answer is too many people have been crushed intellectually and emotionally and they've given up. That's what it's about. It's not what's right or wrong, it's about what we can do and many people say we can't do it. The billionaire class is too powerful, Wall Street is too powerful, the drug companies are too powerful, the corporate media is too powerful, we can't do it. What this campaign is about is saying, you know what, we can create the nation we want to become. And as Bruce just said, the way we create this nation that we know we can become is when we do not allow the Trumps and others of the world to divide us up. So the questions that we are asking in America, why does it happen? that today we have massive income and wealth inequality? Why does it happen that in America today, the richest country in the history of the world, most people don't know that because almost all of the new income and wealth being created is going to the top 1%. Why is it in this great country, we have more people living in poverty than almost any major country on earth, and we have the highest rate of childhood poverty. Why is it that we are the only major country on earth that doesn't guarantee paid family and medical leave? Why is it that we have, Bruce made this point, we have more people in jail than any other country on earth. That's right, that's right. China, four times our size, communist authoritarian country. We have more people in jail than China. That's right, that's right. It is a national tragedy. And disproportionately the people in jail are African American, Latino, Native American. Do you think there may be a connection to the fact that we have more people in jail than we have very, very high rates of youth unemployment. White kids who graduated high school today, unemployed, underemployed, 33%, Latino, 36%, African-American kids, 51%. So here is a not-so-radical idea. How about investing in education and jobs for our young people? Education and jobs, not more jails, not more incarceration. Over the last 30 years, millions of people have been arrested for possession of marijuana. Right now, as part of the Federal Controlled Substance Act, 
Marijuana is a Schedule I drug alongside of heroin. <laughs> now, you can argue the pluses and minuses of marijuana, but it ain't heroin. <laughs> I trust, I trust, I hope and I trust that everybody here knows that heroin is a killer drug devastating my state of Vermont, hitting New England and all over this country very hard. Stay away from damn heroin. But when we talk about what's going on in America, if we stand together, we can significantly change things. Let me give you some examples. Number one, what this campaign is about is doing something fairly radical for American politics. We're telling the truth. You know, the truth is not always pleasant. But the only way we go forward is when we honestly understand what's going on in our world. Right. All right, and here are some truths that are unpleasant. Number one, you live in a country today which has a corrupt campaign finance system undermining American democracy. Now, what democracy is about is not complicated. You have your ideas, I have mine, you disagree with me, you vote for me, you vote against me. That's called democracy. One person, one vote. <laughs> democracy is not about billionaires buying elections. Democracy is not about Wall Street and corporate America putting tens and hundreds of millions of dollars into super PACs. Democracy is not about the Koch brothers and a handful of billionaires spending $900 million in this campaign cycle. That is more money than either the Democratic or Republican parties are spending. When you have a situation where one family is spending more money than either of the major political parties, that's not democracy. That is oligarchy, and we're going to change it. Democracy is not about cowardly Republican governors trying to suppress the vote, making it harder for old people or people of color or young people to participate in the political process. If Republican governors don't have the guts to run in free and fair elections, they should get out of politics and get another job. In America today, we have one of the lowest voter turnouts of any major country on earth. I want to change that. I want to see us have one of the highest voter turnouts. And in America, we need language that is very, very simple. If you are 18 years of age and a citizen of this country, you are registered to vote, end of discussion. And I want everybody, whether you're progressive, conservative, moderate, Democrat, Republican, whatever, to be able to run for office without begging wealthy people for campaign contributions. And that is why I believe we need to move to public funding of elections. So let me repeat to you one promise that I've made for months. 
No nominee of mine to the United States Supreme Court will get that position unless he or she is loud and clear that they will vote to overturn Citizens United. talk about in this campaign is a corrupt campaign finance system and a rigged economy. What does that mean, a rigged economy? Let me give you an example. You've got governors all over this country who are talking about welfare abuse. They're worried about poor people ripping off the welfare system. Let me tell you what really goes on. And when you want to talk about welfare abuse, I want all of you to understand that the major welfare abuser in this country is not some poor mother. It is the wealthiest family in this country, the Walton family of Walmart. Now, what does that mean? What it means is that Walmart, owned by the wealthiest family in America, the Waltons, pays wages so low that many of their employees are forced to go on Medicaid, food stamps, or go into subsidized housing. Who is paying for those food stamps, Medicaid, and subsidized housing? You are. So what you got is the middle class of this country through higher taxes is subsidizing the Walton family that is not paying their workers a living wage. So I say to the Walton family worth some 60, 70 billion dollars, Get off of welfare, pay your workers a living wage. See, that's what a rigged economy is about when you have to subsidize the wealthiest family in America. Now, when we talk about creating an economy that works for all of us, what do we have to do? Number dollar and 25 cent an hour minimum wage is a starvation wage. Yeah. I have talked to workers all across this country, and what they tell me is, Bernie, we can't make it on seven and a quarter an hour. We can't make it on eight. We can't make it on nine bucks an hour. And they're right. And that is why we have to ra got to raise the minimum wage in this country to a living wage, 15 bucks an hour. I have talked, now one of the things about this campaign is talking about issues that the media chooses not to talk about. And the reason is, number one, it's, these are too complicated. You can't say them in a three-second soundbite. Or else they run into conflicts of interest with the people who own the media. But here is an issue that we have got to address. A great nation is not judged by the number of millionaires and billionaires it has. It is judged by how it treats the weakest and most vulnerable amongst us. And when you talk, when we talk about weak and vulnerable, we're talking about little kids. We're talking about kids living in poverty, kids who have nothing kids who were going to totally inadequate child care facilities. And we are also talking about senior citizens. I have talked to seniors, and this doesn't get much discussion, but all across this country you have seniors and disabled veterans trying to make it on twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000 a year. Put yourself right now into the place of somebody who's 80, 85 years old, a disabled vet, a senior. You got health care costs, you got prescription drug costs, you got to keep your house warm in the winter. How do you make it on $12,000 a year? And the answer is, you don't. You don't. A moral people
does not turn its back on those folks who raised us and built this country. Now, in the midst of that, in the midst of millions of seniors struggling to make it on 11, 12,000 a year, many Republicans actually want to cut Social Security. Well, I've got news for them. We're not going to cut Social Security. We're going to expand Social Security benefits. And we are going to make sure that the veterans of this country, the people who put their lives on the line to defend us, get the health care and the benefits that they earn. Now, this campaign is successful because we are listening to people, not just wealthy campaign contributors. I don't go around this country sitting in mansions, collecting millions of dollars, hearing the woes of billionaires. There are other more important issues that I've got to worry about. <laughs> and we listen to young people, and this is what young people are telling me. They're saying, Bernie, how does it happen that we have to end up 30, 50, $80,000 in debt for the crime of trying to get a decent education? What I ask of you, what I ask of you and I ask of the American people is think outside of the box, think outside of the status quo. Take a deep breath and just ask yourself this question. Everybody here knows, everybody in America knows that in order to compete in a competitive global economy, we need the best educated workforce in the world, correct? All right. This is kind of a no-brainer. A no-brainer. To have the best educated workforce, we have got to encourage young people to get all of the education that they need. We should not be punishing people for getting an education. We should encourage people to get an education. You want to hear crazy? Here's crazy. Talk to a young person in Iowa, went to college for two years, $60,000 in debt, dropped out of school. A young woman in Burlington, Vermont, my city, her dream was to go to medical school. She accomplished that dream, now practicing primary health care. She is $300,000 in debt. A young dentist. Young dentist in Iowa, $400,000 in debt. What, it is crazy. It is absolutely crazy. So we're gonna do, we're gonna do two things. Number one, in the year 2016, when we talk about public education, you cannot just continue to talk about first grade through 12th grade. The world has changed. First grade through 12th grade was a great idea 50 years ago. You had a high school degree 50 years ago. You can go out and earn a good living. That world has changed. So when I talk about public education today, it must mean free tuition at public colleges and universities. And some people say, oh, this is a radical, radical idea. It is not a radical idea. It is not a radical. I mean, right now, tuition, college education in Germany, Scandinavia is free. All right, and it's free because they understand that the future of their countries depend on young people getting the best education that they can. So this is not a radical idea. In fact, I'll tell you this. Some of you may not know this. 50 or 60 years ago, you could go to major and excellent public colleges and universities in America virtually tuition-free. That was America back then. 
If we could do it 60 years ago, we damn well can do it today. Now, many of my critics say, well, that's a great idea, but how are you going to pay for it? It's just so expensive. So let me, let me back it up a little bit. Just talked to some of the media a moment ago, and they asked this question. It's a fair question. This is what everybody here has got to understand. In the last 30 years in this country, there has been a massive redistribution of wealth. Problem is it's gone in the wrong direction. Middle class has shrunk trillions of dollars, have left the middle class, gone into the hands of the top one-tenth of one percent. Top one-tenth of one percent has seen a doubling in the percentage of wealth they own. Now, when the middle class was shrinking and almost all new wealth and income going to the top one-tenth of one percent, I didn't hear any of the establishment saying, Oh, this is terrible, this is awful. But when some of us talk about redistributing that wealth and income back to the middle class, oh, this is the worst thing that ever happened. <laughs> so I'll tell you how we're going to pay. I will tell you how we're going to pay to make public colleges and universities tuition free and substantially lower interest rates on student debt. And what we are going to do is impose a tax on Wall Street speculation. Now, all of you know that 10 years ago or so, Wall Street's greed, illegal behavior, and recklessness drove this country into the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. Now, after Wall Street did that, they went to the Congress and they said, please bail us out. Against my vote, Congress did bail them out. Now, if we could bail out the crooks on Wall Street, I think it is now time for Wall Street to help the middle class. And that is why I believe we should impose a tax on Wall Street speculation. Every psychologist who studies human development understands that the most important years of a human being's life are zero through four. That's when we develop intellectually and emotionally. And yet today, when I talk to young couples with little babies, they say, Bernie, I can't afford, we can't afford good quality and affordable child care. We can't find that. I believe that we have got to transform our child care system create hundreds of thousands of jobs, making sure that the littlest Americans, the youngest, the future of this country, have the early education that they deserve. <laughs> this campaign has talked to the African American community. And the African-American community is saying, how does it happen that we have so many people in jail? How does it happen that a black male baby born today, unless we change this, stands a one in four chance of ending up in jail? How does it happen? How does it happen that unarmed African-Americans are being killed by police officers. And what that tells me, and it's not just the African-American community that's upset about it, it is all Americans. We need real criminal justice reform. And let me tell you what that means. I have 
I'm a former mayor, mayor of the largest city in Vermont, Burlington, Vermont. I have worked with police officers for many, many years. The vast majority of police officers. In terms of criminal justice, we have in this nation a very, very serious problem with substance abuse and substance addiction. And we need to recognize that alcohol or drug addiction is not a criminal justice issue, it is a health care issue. Which means that we need to significantly expand our capabilities to treat substance and drug addiction. It's a huge issue that we've got to address. When we talk about criminal justice, we also have to end this concept of minimal sentencing. Judges need more discretion. When we talk about criminal justice, we need to understand that our rate of recidivism, people who leave jail, go to the civil society, they come back to jail in much too large numbers. That means that when people leave jail, they need to have the education and the job training they need so they don't get caught up in the same environment which got them into jail in the first place. This campaign is talking to our brothers and sisters in the Latino community. And what they are saying is that they are tired of living in fear, living under the shadows. They want and need a path toward citizenship. This campaign is talking to people in the Native American community. And I don't have to explain to anybody here that the way our country from day one has treated Native Americans is obscene. And those problems continue today. I talked to some Native American leaders in Minnesota last week. 50% of their kids today are dropping out of school, high school. Alcoholism is rampant. Poverty is off the charts. Young people are killing themselves. Drug addiction is widespread. For those people who were here first, we owe them respect and dignity. We've got to change our policy. Everybody here knows how real change comes about and never comes about from the top on down. It always comes from the bottom on up. Here in the Midwest, 100 years ago or longer, workers said to their employers, we will not be treated like animals. We need dignity. They stood, they fought, they were beaten up, they were jailed, they were on picket lines to form unions. So that they could engage in collective bargaining, earn decent wages and decent benefits. That's how change takes place. Change took place and takes place in the civil rights movement when the African-American community and their white allies said loudly, no, this country will not continue racism, segregation, and bigotry. And millions of people demanded change. A hundred years ago today, women did not have the right to vote. They did not have the right to go to many schools or do the jobs that they wanted to do. A hundred years ago, not a long time in history. 
And yet women and their male allies said, sorry, women in this country will not continue to be second-class citizens. If we were in this room 10 years ago, and I'm talking about how real change takes place, if we were in this room 10 years ago, which is no time at all from a historical perspective, somebody jumped up and said, you know, I think gay marriage will be made legal in 50 states of this country in the year 2015. The person next to him would have said, what are you smoking? <laughs> which raises another interesting issue. what happened, and, and this is what change is about, it's the most important point I think I can make to you. What happened is the gay community and their straight allies said, you know what, in America, and believe me, against enormous opposition and hatred, gay community said, you know, in this country people should have the right to love whoever they want regardless of gender. And today, and, and you cannot appreciate how rapidly that transformation has taken place. Today you go to high schools in my state or in my conservative areas, and you ask kids about gay marriage, and they say, what's the issue? We don't know what the issue is. That's what a revolutionary change is about. When you... And I'll give you another example, even more contemporary. If we were here seven years ago, and somebody jumped up and said, you know, Bernie, the $7.25 an hour minimum wage is a disaster. I was in Detroit a couple of years ago, and I talked to young people working at McDonald's. These were adults. Some of them had kids. Seven and a quarter an hour, 20 hours a week, got on a bus, went to a different McDonald's, trying to make a living. Now, seven, eight years ago, somebody said, you know, we've got to raise that minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour. People would say, what, are you crazy? That's doubling the minimum wage? We can't. That's just too radical an idea. But you know what happened? Because people in the fast food industry, in McDonald's, at Burger King, at Wendy's, all these places, they stood up and they fought back. And you know what happened? A couple of years ago in Seattle, $15 an hour minimum wage. <laughs> in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, in Oregon, $15 an hour minimum wage. And that's what we have to do nationally. So what is my point? My point is that an idea, whether it is civil rights and the idea, just another example, again, you take it for granted, but don't. If we were here 40 years ago and somebody said, oh, in 2008, we're going to elect an African American as president of the United States, nobody would have believed it. And this has nothing to do with you like Obama, you don't like Obama. It is the fact that the American people overcame centuries of racism and said, you know what, we're going to vote for somebody based on his ideas and not the color of his skin. A big deal. So my point is that when my opponent or anybody else says, well, Bernie's a nice guy, but he's thinking too big making public colleges and universities tuition free. Oh, that is a crazy idea. It is not a crazy idea. We can make it happen. And mark my words, mark my words, if millions of students and young people demand it, it will happen. And then 20 years from now, some guy or woman will be up here and she'll say, well, you know, 20 years ago, public colleges and universities weren't tuition free. And people say, that's crazy. How could that be? <laughs> that's how change comes about. Have a vision. 
be prepared to stand up and fight for what is right. Now, I want to just say a few words about some of the significant differences between Secretary Clinton and myself. Number one, number one, and this is a very profound difference. Secretary Clinton has a number of super PACs. In the last reporting period, her largest super PAC collected $15 million from Wall Street. Now, every politician in the world, Democrat or Republican, always says, oh, yes, I get all this money from Wall Street and the drug companies and the fossil fuel industry. Doesn't impact me. Oh, it doesn't really matter. Well, then the question that we have to ask is, if it doesn't matter, why are these people pouring millions of dollars into your campaign? Now, there's a lot that I can say about the greed and recklessness and fraudulent behavior of Wall Street, but what I will also say is they are not dumb. They do not throw their money around for no reason at all. Second of all, Secretary Clinton has given major speeches behind closed doors to Wall Street receiving $225,000 a speech. Now, what I think is, if you're going to get paid $225,000 for a speech to Wall Street, it must be a really fantastic speech. <laughs> and it's surely a speech you're going to want to share with the American people, right? So I would hope that the Secretary is prepared to share that extraordinary $225,000 speech with all of us. <laughs> Second issue, an issue the media doesn't cover very much, but it is of enormous consequence for our country and for the Midwest in particular. We have had, for the last 30 plus years, disastrous trade policies. Now, I know it's not a sexy issue, Lodge. They are written by corporate America and the big money interests. These are the guys who write it. And what do they want? What they want is to have an agreement which enables them to shut down manufacturing plants in the United States of America so they don't have to pay workers here in Illinois or Michigan or Ohio 20, 25 bucks an hour. They don't have to pay them a decent wage. They don't have to negotiate with unions. They don't have to protect environmental laws. They can shut down here, they can go to Mexico, they can go to China, they can go to Vietnam, they can go to very low-wage countries, and then they can bring their products back into this country. Here's what's happened since 2001. Since 2001 in America, we have lost almost 60,000 factories, millions of decent-paying jobs. Our disastrous trade policies are one of the reasons as to why that has happened. People have lost good paying jobs, then they go out and work for jobs paying them eight or nine bucks an hour. You can't make it on that. Now on that issue, I will tell you that from day one, I understood what these trade agreements were about. I knew that they were designed to protect corporate America at the expense of working people. I voted and helped lead the opposition against virtually every one of these trade agreements. <laughs> On the other hand, Secretary Clinton supported NAFTA. She supported permanent normal trade relations with China. Those agreements have cost us millions of jobs as a nation hit the Midwest particularly hard. If elected president, trust me, we will have a new set of trade policies. Corporate America wants us to buy their products. They tell us that every night in 30-second TV ads. If they want us to buy their products, the time is overdue.
for them to start manufacturing those products in America, not in China. Third area, foreign policy. Enormously important part of what a president does. 2002, I heard, listen very carefully when I was a member of the House, what George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, and all those people were saying about Iraq. I listened carefully. I didn't believe what they said. I voted against the war in Iraq. And it gives me no joy to tell you, but if you go to my website, berniesanders.com, hear what I said in 2002 about what would happen when a political vacuum developed in Iraq after Saddam Hussein was overthrown. It's not just good enough to overthrow dictators. You've got to be thinking about what happens the day after. That war in Iraq is the worst, worst foreign policy disaster in the modern history of America. I voted against that war. Secretary Clinton supported that war, voted for it. 1996, there was a homophobic piece of legislation brought forth by right-wing Republicans. It was called the so-called Defense of Marriage Act, DOMA. What it said is that if a gay, if a couple, gay couple were married in a state that allowed for gay marriage, their marriage could not be transferred, the rights of that marriage could not be transferred to other states, and that gay married couples could not enjoy federal benefits like heterosexual couples. <laughs> now the world has changed in the last 20 years. But back, <laughs> back in 1996, Voting against that homophobic legislation was not an easy vote. Vast majority of members of Congress did not vote against DOMA. I did. Secretary Clinton, <laughs> Secretary Clinton supported DOMA. <laughs> now, when we talk about the issues facing our country, I want to tell you that I am a member of the Senate Committee on the Environment, the Senate Committee on Energy. Let there be no doubt, I don't want anybody in this room to have any doubt about it. Climate change is real. It is caused by human activity. It is already wrecking havoc in our country and around the world, and don't let anybody tell you differently. We have a moral responsibility to leave this planet in a way that is healthy and habitable for future generations. We have got to have the guts to stand up to the fossil fuel industry. And and tell them that their short-term profits are not more important than the future of this planet. <laughs> and when we think, and when we talk about thinking outside of the box, envisage an energy system which is based on energy efficiency and sustainable energy. We can do that. And when we think big, please understand, there is one major country on Earth, the United States, that does not guarantee health care to all of its people. The United Kingdom does it. France does it, Germany does it, Scandinavia does it, Holland does it, our neighbors to the north, Canada does it. Health care for all. Now, I've been criticized for saying this, but let me say it again loudly and clearly. 
I believe health care is a right of all people, not a privilege. Yes, I believe we can take on the private insurance companies and the drug companies and pass a Medicare for all health care program. Now, one other charge thrown against me is people say, well, Bernie is a nice guy, but, you know, he's just not electable. Can't win an election. So let me... Let me set the record straight. There have been a lot of polls go up and down, and polls are not all that important. But there have been a lot of polls out there, most of the polls, that put Bernie Sanders against Donald Trump. We beat him in almost all those polls. In the last CNN poll, Hillary Clinton was beating him by eight points. We beat him by 12 points. And that's true of many polls around the country. <laughs> Let me tell you why we will defeat Trump. We will defeat Trump because in America, people understand that to togetherness, bringing our people together, is more important and Trump's divisiveness dividing us up. The sense of community, the sense of community, knowing that we are not alone, that we are here to help each other, trumps selfishness. And most importantly, what the American people profoundly understand, based in all of the teachings of every great religion on earth, is that love trumps hatred. On March 15th, on March 15th, there will be a primary here in Illinois. If there is a large voter turnout, if working people and young people come out and vote, we will win. Please make that happen. Thank you all.